call this work session to order, and I don't know everybody in this audience, but I'll introduce myself. I'm Judy Johansson. I'm president of the Port of Portland Commission, and welcome Mayor Sam Adams and uh, Portland City Commissioners who are with us, and uh, Commissioner Leonard, I presume, is on his way. He actually emailed uh, me as a family emergency. He oh, okay. He not be able to make it, but we have a quorum here. Okay, good. All right. Um, so I do want to welcome you as well as the uh, Bureau of Planning staff and the West Hayden Island Consulting Team to our working session today. And I want to thank the City of Portland, especially for undertaking this effort and for the incredible time and attention that the City has and the Council have given to this question of the annexation of West Hayden Island. So thank you. Um, this work session today is an opportunity to review the options for development for 500 acres of habitat and recreation and 300 acres for deep draft marine terminal development as the basis for a possible annexation of West Hayden Island to, into the city of Portland. Now the port, just for history, the port purchased West Hayden Island about 20 years ago to meet a future marine facility development need. Ten years after the port purchased that, into the, uh, it was brought into the urban growth boundary for that purpose. So this joint session today is a significant one, and the timing is very good. Uh, with the 43-foot deepened channel in, uh, in the river and the demand in Asia for agricultural and other bulk products uh, seems to be growing, it seems that this increased demand on the Columbia for export facilities uh, is timely and this conversation is timely. So disposition of West Hayden Island is something that we as a port and I know the city are very anxious to um, resolve and sort through and the work today is going to bring us a major step closer to that resolution. Uh, our meeting today is a work session and I say that it's a work session for the commissioners and we will not be taking public testimony but I want to thank all of you in the public for attending today and I just want to outline the agenda for our work session. Um, first of all, Eric Einstrom will talk about the context for the project and give us an update. Um, oh, Matt. Matt Lick. Lack <laughs> Lack and all. Yeah. I wouldn't have said that. Um, and Peter Hummel uh, will overview some of the concepts. And then the commission and the council will have a Q&A session and um, I think this whole thing should take about an hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes. And what I'd like to do before we do that, uh, Mayor, is hand this over to you for your opening and welcoming remarks. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's also uh, it's a great honor to serve with this particular city council because in the last two and a half, uh, three years, uh, the city council has taken on some of the longest standing, toughest problems uh, that have been around for a couple of decades, whether it's uh, Commissioner Leonard's uh, championing of a ballot measure that <clears throat> allows us to replace uh, needed uh, fire equipment and upgrade our electronics, uh, whether it's Commissioner uh, Fritz who has uh, championed and, and and saw to fruition the creation of the Office of Equity to begin to address the inequities um, in this city that are long-standing, Commissioner Saltzman, who just most recently um, is working on uh, the, the creation of an independent utility uh, review commission to, to bring uh, tr more transparency and public confidence in the rate making of the sewer and water agencies. Also on that list is West Hayden Island, uh, a pro a, a, an opportunity and a challenge that's uh, two decades old. It is a zoned industrial, um, but has significant uh, environmental uh, resources or opportunities right now. Um, and I'm very pleased that we are working on it, and I am very determined that we resolve its future. I have 15 more months left in my term, and uh, I intend for this to be one of those issues that we resolve. I want to thank the Port Commission for uh, being partner with us. I want to thank the environmental community representatives that are in the office here uh, for and leaders for, for their partnership on this as well. Um, it is not just because it's been a very two-decade long process. It's not just because we started the process should we complete it, but because 
with the uh, decisions uh, now moved to the state and federal level for the Columbia River crossing uh, with the Superfund and, and our efforts to have a healthy and working uh, Willamette River uh, with the city's uh, state-mandated 25-year comprehensive plan, which we call the Portland Plan, uh, which we are required to complete next year. There are a lot of smart, substantive reasons uh, to do this work now. Um, I am I'm very happy with the direction that it's headed in terms of this is probably one of the most researched and one of the most um, aired out uh, pieces of land uh, in terms of future considerations of its use. Uh, any piece of land uh, in the city of Portland at least in my 20 years in local government, and uh, that's appropriate. We want to get it right, and this city council is established for its general esprit de corps of having an environmentally healthy and economically working uh, marine, um, marine uh, river uh, districts of our city. So um, today is uh, a concept plan. It's not a blueprint for, descript, uh, for development. It gives us all an opportunity to, though, ask the on-the-ground questions that need to be asked. Uh, and as staff has briefed me and asked me to reiterate, um, the, the two uh, concepts that have been put out for public discussion offer sort of a mix and match and so, sort of be able to see sort of the pluses and minuses on both and all sides, uh, and uh, it can be a mix and match um, discussion as well between the two. So with that, thank you, Madam Chair. Glad right. to be here. Excellent. Well, um, at this point, we'll turn it over to our uh, respective experts. And uh, Eric, are you you're going to kick it off? I can start off with I feel with like the you're one of us now, Eric. You've been <laughs> yeah. at one I've been of our meetings. <laughs> Thank you. As the, the mayor indicated, our, our project objective is to, to resolve the future of how West Hidden Island will be used. Um, the sequence of that effort uh, has a couple steps. Uh, last year we completed a number of foundation studies and, and tried to enter a lot of technical background information. Uh, this year our focus to date has been the preparing the concept plans that we're going to brief you on today. Uh, after we finish this step, we're going to be moving into considering the, the more specific annexation and zoning implementing agreements that, that would go before city council. The, this slide is a slide that the Port Commission has seen before, but it shows the bigger uh, view of, of the long-term process that we've used to consider the future of West Hayden Island, starting with the urban growth boundary, concept plan, annexation and zoning, and eventually uh, – site design and, and a federal uh, permitting process will be uh, part of that, uh, certainly. Uh, and then finally, if, uh, if all of that lines up, there would be a, a specific development proposal moving forward. So this is one step. The slide shows uh, the context of West Hayden Island. A couple things to note here uh, is the, the, uh, there are a number of utility corridors that cross the site, and that influences the, the design of, of the facility. There is... Uh, access on the north side to the deep water channel in the Columbia River. It's, uh, the site is directly across the river from the Port of Vancouver facilities. Uh, it has direct access to the mainline railroad and is as close to the uh, I-5 freeway. It is also note notable that there is uh, a current use on the West Hayden Island site uh, for uh, handling dredge uh, materials from the river. So the mayor mentioned this, why now? Um, we're also working on the Columbia Crossing, and we've completed the, the Hayden Island Neighborhood Plan, and as the mayor mentioned, that we're in the process of updating our comprehensive plan. All these things point to trying to resolve West Hayden Island as well. Last summer, the uh, city council passed Resolution 36805, which gave us a, a roadmap for, for going through this concept planning process and directed us to look at a 300-acre uh, marine terminal footprint with at least 500 acres of open space. The council also directed a number of additional studies to supplement the concept plan, including traffic analysis, uh, a look at what, how we might manage the open space portion of the site into the future, 
um, a look at how the, the two ports coordinate and what, how that relates to West Hayden Island. And then uh, probably the most significant piece is the benefit cost analysis, which would uh, start from the foundation of this concept plan because it provides the specifics that, that we would need to, to understand th those costs and benefits. And when, when's that, that due to be given to all of us? That will be coming in the in early part of 2012, so a few more months. Um, we, we need to complete the concept planning work so that the, the cost-benefit people have something to work with. And will they be looking at both the concepts that are on the table? They'll be given all the information that went through the, the concept planning process. Thank you. Uh, background is, as the, was mentioned earlier, the site was brought into the urban growth boundary in 1983. Metro is designated as regionally significant industrial site as well as an important habitat conservation area and has directed the city to prepare a district plan for the area. Some uh, context from the economic perspective for the site, uh, it's on the shipping channel uh, near the Port of Vancouver rail. Uh, an important piece is the parcel sides provides flexibility for a variety of different types of marine terminals, and that's not true for all the other, a lot of the other vacant industrial land in the city. Uh, a significant part of the site design challenge is, is what we call a, a unit train access, essentially, which is to get uh, what would be an industry standard uh, rail configuration onto the site, and, and the, that's typically a close to a 10,000 foot or two mile long train. And this diagram just shows if, if you had that train stretched out from the entry point on West Hayden Island on the south, it would extend all the way to the, the sewage treatment plant on the north, it would extend through Vancouver and in, over towards Fort Vancouver. So it's a significant challenge to sort of unwind a train like that onto this site. Uh, this picture is of uh, some existing development on the Rivergate area, which, but it's to give you a sense of the kind of land uses we're talking about for West Hayden Island. This uh, picture shows a, a grain facility, so a potash uh, facility, as well as a, an auto facility. Uh, there's a, a rail loop, which is smaller than the current um, <coughs> standards, but it, it does show you what we mean by a rail loop. And then the, the docks here are also illustrate how you can uh, – put a dock like this slightly offshore to minimize the shallow water habitat impacts. And so that's the kind of dock you would likely see on West Hayden Island due to the, the environmental issues. This is additional context that shows a map of the, the other vacant uh, industrial land uh, in the city. And this is our essentially our land supply from an, from an economic jobs perspective. And as you can see, the, the 300 acre Roughly 300-acre footprint on West Hayden Island is is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, parcel in that inventory. If it were annexed into the city, some environmental context. Uh, it's obviously a, a large uh, piece of land that that has uh, relevance to the regional network of natural areas. Uh, it is important to migrating birds and other species of concern. Uh, there are large areas of cottonwood forest, wetlands, uh, meadows, beaches. Um, and uh, the shallow water habitat along the island is very important to, to salmon migration. Um, this picture shows a, a, a map of the vegetation uh, patterns on the site, um, the darker colors being the, the deeper forest and the, the light green being the more meadow and grassland kind of habitat. This sandy grassy area here is the, the dredge material handling area that I mentioned. Uh, and this, this area is Smith and Bybee Lakes to the south. This is a map showing sort of the, the underwater features of where the shallow and deeper water is around the site. And as you can see, there's a shallow water kind of ringing the, the shore of the site. And also importantly, there's a number of wetlands, particularly along the south side of the site, that um, are below ordinary high water. So what that means is when there's a when the river's running higher, they flood and provide important off off channel habitat for fish and, and other species. And so that's a significant piece of the site design challenge. Uh, this is a map of context from an environmental perspective. It shows the city's inventory of significant natural resource lands. Um, and uh, obviously if if Hayden Island, uh, which is the, the study area we're talking about, were on that map, it's, it's a significant site from that perspective as well. So uh, the short story is that this site is very significant both economically and in, environmentally. Um, the mayor mentioned that, that both the port and the city have, have contributed significant uh, resources to this project. 
we have uh, an advisory committee working with us, and this is the, the list of those, those committee members, some of which are in the audience here today. Um, they have uh, put in a lot of work, and, and uh, this image shows uh, one of their site visits. I think it's probably the wettest site visit we had this year. Um, the goals of the concept planning process are to, it's a really a baseline for considering zoning and annexation agreements. So as the mayor said, we're not going to go and immediately put out bids to develop these plans. It's, it's to understand the on-the-ground issues that will affect um, what we might say in those agreements. So in particular, uh, things like where would the rail footprint be, which affects where the zoning might be put in place, uh, what kinds of infrastructure, either private or public, might we need to put in place, and what are the agreements that go with annexation around those things? What's our, our strategy for paying for them? Um, recreation, what is our uh, long-term approach to recreation in the 500-acre, and to what degree of recreation do we envision? And that affects, again, some of the zoning as well as some of the infrastructure we might need. Um, natural area strategy, how do we maintain those and enhance those lands over time and, and uh, that also affects both the zoning and, and some of the, the uh, annexation agreement um, elements. So what we hope to accomplish through this look at these concepts is uh, to identify the types and locations of different land uses within the site, um, understand what might happen so that we can develop and come to agreement on what would be allowed on the site and what are the parameters of that um, in terms of, of either regulations or through intergovernmental agreements or other other arrangements. Um, the, it also provides a basis for studying the benefits and costs of annexation. And with any annexation, um, the city goes through this process of trying to understand what, it's, what that annexation will bring in terms of, of either revenue or costs to, to the public. Um, and it also leads to what we call an ESEE analysis, which is a state mandated process to consider the economic, social, energy, and environmental issues of that zoning action and that annexation action, uh, which is something that we'd be going through in the spring when we get uh, to that step. Um, we are kicking off a one-month uh, period of more intensive public involvement uh, with this meeting, and um, this evening we'll start off that with a, a open house at the Expo Center uh, and then Saturday there'll be another open house on the on Hayden Island. Um, I believe it's at the Oxford Suites uh, Hotel. Um, we have staff office hours on the island during the dates on the screen, and then the project advisory committee will meet next Friday to discuss these concepts and hear preliminary input from the public. The next steps are that uh, we would take the input from these. Concept A and Concept B, and uh, Worley Parsons, our consultant, would develop a, essentially a hybrid proposal based on the elements that, that are most viable and, and preferred. Uh, BPS staff would then use that as the basis for beginning to come up with zoning and annexation agreement proposals that would be the, the focus of the advisory committee's discussion moving into 2012. Uh, it would help us with the cost-benefit report, which we would bring back to, to the commission and the city council by March of this, this coming year. Um, and then we expect the city to be going to the Planning and Sustainability Commission and the city council for uh, formal hearings on the proposal starting in the May-June time frame uh, in 2012. And with that, that uh, concludes my summary. I'd like to now introduce Matt Lackanell uh, with Worley Parsons, and he's going to go through the, the specifics of the two concepts we have. Flip back to that one slide that showed the timeline. It was probably your first or second slide. Sure. I think um, they uh, switched. Oh, did we? Just oh, you switch? did already. Okay. Switch the. Okay. Okay. Get the guy who knows what he's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead and go through the next one. That one. No. Back. There you go. Yeah. I just want to get this in my. <clears throat> So the, the step three portion, then, our proposed schedule would be to be at the end of that step three process mid, midway through 2012. Right. Okay. Good. So you feel like 
you're on pace to do that? We do. This, this getting the concept plans to this step is a significant milestone, and it really allows us to move forward with the, the, the analysis. Okay. Thank you. Okay. First of all, good morning. Um, as Eric mentions, I'm Matt Lackinell. Um, I'm the project manager for Worley Parsons, and I've been slated to uh, try to see if we can come up with some uh, fantastic uh, concept plans for the development of West Hayden Island. Um, throughout uh, this, uh, what we want to do initially here is give some background information on the creation of these concept plans, and then we'll actually run through uh, the concept plans. Uh, myself, we'll look through the uh, or direct you through the operations and transportation sections of the concept plans. And then I'll turn it over to Peter Hummel um, with Anchor Environmental to look at the environmental and recreational components. And then we'll open it up for uh, questions from that point moving forward. Just a, some, some quick background. Um, when we looked at this, we looked at it with uh, three distinct areas that really needed to come together um, in looking at the concepts for West Hayden Island. Those three areas consume the habitat and environment, the recreation and community, and the industrial port, and trying to bring those three independent sectors into one unified concept plan that works for everyone um, in, the, uh, in the process. Um, what we want to make sure that everybody understands when looking at these concept plans is that these are for review and comment. Um, as the mayor mentions, by no means are these blueprints for development, and we want to be clear in stating that. These are really the first issues of concept plans that we want to get out to the public and get people's input before moving forward. Um, and uh, again, another reiteration here is these, these are not exclusive of one another. They have independent entities in each one of the concepts that we want to make sure that everybody's clear on. It's not alternative A or alternative B. It's different components of alternative, and a, alternative a and B that can be pulled together um, into a final concept plan for moving forward. And just a note, off-site considerations were, were really not a part of these plans. This is really on-site West Hayden Island um, concepts only. So without further ado here, um, we'll actually get to the concept plans. Um, we call alternative A. Um, when, when talking with the advisory committee, uh, really what we wanted to focus on was having multiple bulk products as well as autos facilitated at this, uh, at the, on the development. With that, the rail infrastructure, obviously, is a critical piece in the development. Um, we have arrival and departure in both directions, north and south, from the I-5 main line. There's four staging trains on site. Um, the train lengths are 10,000 foot um, based on unit, uh, unit trains. Um, and all of the, without getting into the details, the train specs are all to BN standards. Um, for alternative A, the transportation access uh, from the vehicular standpoint will be either from East Hayden Island or from Marine Drive, and that would uh, encompass a bridge. Um, Marine, obviously, would be from the uh, Columbia River main channel, nothing from the Oregon Slough, and that is both barge and vessel traffic. And just as a point of interest, the site elevation would be approximately 30 feet, which is above the ordinary high water. And the current mainline rail elevation is 50 feet, so obviously there's a, a, rail differ, or a grade differential that's quite significant that needs to be taken into consideration. And it's another uh, kind of a hamstringing the rail um, access to the site. Apologize for the, the level of detail. It's kind of hard to see some of this, but hopefully the mouse will direct you. Here's the uh, main line, the I-5 main line here that runs north and south. And this first concept, what we plan on doing is either bringing off of that main line in a northerly direction or a southerly direction onto the terminal site itself. These blue lines represent staging and storage um, for the terminal. The green would be handling autos and autos alone. And the red would be handling um, the multiple bulk products, commodities. Um, the way that this uh, balloon loop arrangement uh, facilitates the terminal is such that both multiple bulk products and autos can be handled simultaneously. Okay. What you see here is a representation of the auto facility. This is approximately 70 acres here for the auto facility. And right here is a, one form of bulk product and then another form of bulk product. The bulk products that we use as an example here are potash in this long elongated building on the southern side and then silos on the northerly side for grain. 
Alternative B is, excuse me, very, very similar. Um, all the specs within, with regard to the rail infrastructure are equal. Um, transportation access is only from East Hayden Island. Um, and again, barge and vessel traffic from the Columbia River main channel and uh, the rail north-south I-5 route. Again, the same site elevation intricacies associated with this development. The one thing you obviously notice when we flip to this is the boundaries are quite different, um, and this is something that needs to be evaluated. Again, northern, oops, sorry, northern access, southern access to the site, ingress and egress, both directions, blue, staging and storage, red, multiple bulk products, and the green is the auto facility. Okay. And then, obviously, this is the best vessel traffic. This is the uh, ship, and barges would probably be brought into the interior side of this dock for potentially a lighter in operation or a, or a transshipment facility. Um, autos would be brought in here via row row facility. What, yeah, what kind of facility? Oh, roll off, sorry. Roll on, roll off. It's for an auto facility. So it's extended over the channel? And it's, or this, extended it, over into the, the Into the Columbia River main channel here. Okay. And they just drive on and off? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to Peter now and let him kind of browse through and give a general summary of the environmental and the recreational components associated with these impacts. So introduce Peter Hummel with Anchor Environmental. Just before you move on, I have a question about alternative B. There's a parking access road on the far right side. That is, does that exist now? It looks like it's going through some homes. This area here? I'm looking at this map that I have in front of me. That's a recreation component. Actually, Peter will probably address that when he goes through his part of the presentation. Thank you. Can I ask you one quick question as well? I think you, early on you made a comment about off-site considerations not a part of this plan. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what you meant by that. Yeah, what we didn't look at is off-site rail alternatives or off-site shipping or barging activities, okay. i.e. putting a terminal upstream or downstream that would actually utilize this as a transshipment facility. Okay. Those weren't looked after. Okay. Could Good. you go back one slide just for a second, please? Uh, one more. Sorry, I went the wrong way on you. One more. <laughs> I want to see the, the – thank you. You have a different bridge set up for both uh, Alternative A and Alternative B. I, you see what – to the dock? The dock? Yeah, it's based on where the layout of the, the boundary layout is. So in Alternative B, you can bring barges in, but in Alternative A, you can't, or you have to go around? No, al sorry. Alternative A, you could facilitate barges, and it would be on the interior here as well. But th then just do me a favor. Go to Alternative B. Yeah. I knew this would happen. <laughs> you have a different setup for that. On the outside there. That's correct, yeah. It's because of the deep water situation and the access, because the boundaries changed. In Alternative A, the boundary is actually over here. And we have the trestle that goes out and accesses it this direction to where the boundary has changed and it's moved more easterly. So we actually have the, uh, the uh, access for the bulk products on the easterly side that accesses the same dock facility. And A and B are both 300 acres? They are. Okay. And, and both consistent with the council resolution? No. <laughs> Alternative B is not consistent with the council resolution, and that was based on advisory committee conversations and looking at potential environmental impacts if we were to modify those boundaries. So will you get into where the inconsistencies are? We will. Okay. Uh, yeah. That'll be part. Okay. Yeah. Backwards. <clears throat> Next slide. On the course factor. Okay. Which one? Hey, good morning. I'm Peter Hummel with uh, Anchor QEA. Good morning. And thank you. Uh, so uh, I am going to uh, just um, give a little bit of background on some of the things that we were considering uh, in coming up with the uh, habitat and recreation aspects of the two alternatives uh, and then talk about those aspects of each alternative um, in a minute. So... 
this uh, this is a, a hill shade uh, lidar version of the showing the topography as it exists on the site. The previous slide was showing the historic conditions, and the the basic message uh, here is that the width of the island uh, has expanded over time due to the placement of uh, dredge material, and I think that this. Um, view is, is very helpful in seeing where that has occurred. On the south side of the I island along Oregon Slough, you can see um, six distinct, actually five distinct ridges of uh, dredge material placement or, or groins. Um, and in between each one of those are low areas uh, of wetlands and shallow water habitat with the blue lines. On the west end of the island, so those are, those are in these locations. Um, and then on the west of the end of the island, you can see three, I'm sorry, four uh, mounds of, of higher material, also from dredge placement. Uh, and then uh, there is the, the dredge, um, active dredge placement area uh, in this portion. Oops. I'll get used to this in a minute. Uh, so this is the uh, same vegetation map um, that Eric was showing earlier. Just a couple of things to um, note here. Um, the uh, darker green is the um, forest habitat. Those tend to be the least disturbed areas uh, on the island from the past uh, dredge material placement activities and the power line corridors. Uh, the power line corridors run east-west, uh, and there's two north-south power line corridors here. Um, the other um, habitat types uh, are the wetlands in, in the light blue, uh, which um, in the interior of the island are less disturbed areas around the edges. They are kind of the result of um, changes from uh, dredge material placement and then there's also the ports wetland mitigation area in this location, um, which is a, a created wetland. Um, and, uh, and then the light uh, yellow color and the uh, orange colors, the orange color is a, is a shrubland habitat and the yellow is a grassland uh, habitat. Those tend to occur in the most um, recently disturbed areas. Uh, this is showing the, some of the uh, kind of evaluations of the different habitat types. As Eric mentioned, this entire area is considered kind of a, a special habitat um, zone uh, of high value. Um, but these evaluations show that the areas that are more disturbed, you know, have a different um, function as opposed to the, the less disturbed areas. And these are just a few photos of the site showing um, some of the different kinds of habitat and um, areas of, of disturbance with the, um, the east-west and the north-south power line corridors, beaches along the Columbia River, shallow water habitat, and wetlands along Oregon Slough. Uh, so this is a, um, a, a version of uh, Concept A uh, showing um, intensity of uh, recreational use and access, uh, and this is uh, based on sort of trying to be consistent with how the city views um, park um, properties uh, and, and showing uh, the most people-oriented um, portions of the site would be the, um, the red area, which we're calling intensive use. Basically, this is going to be a passive use uh, recreation area, but uh, we wanted to identify an area where there's uh, parking and restrooms and picnic areas um, so that people have a place to kind of enter the site. Um, and that is rel very small um, given the total acreage. I mean, we're talking maybe five acres or so. Um, the purple areas are intended to be kind of a um, moderate level of use where there's um, more developed trails um, uh, that are accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, and these generally follow 
the areas closest to the proposed marine terminal and uh, areas of, of disturbance such as power line corridors and areas of, of dredge material placement. And then the yellow is showing the areas of uh, limited access uh, where there would be kind of more nature trails, um, would not necessarily be disabled accessible. Um, these would be, you know, maybe four or five feet wide natural surface um, trails. So the width of that band is actually uh, going to be much, much narrower than that. This is just a diagram. And then the green is showing areas where there's really no uh, access uh, in terms of trails or um, that kind of thing. So um, just a few other highlights um, for concept A. This, this concept is based on accessing the site from the south um, via a new bridge over the Oregon Slough uh, connecting to Marine Drive and uh, is showing, you know, this one area of intensive, we're calling it intensive recreation, but basically it's a, an existing uh, open meadow area where there's been past dredge material placement where you'd have uh, parking, picnicking, and restrooms and access to the water. Uh, and then it is one thing about this alternative that's different than concept B is that it has a trail system that accesses the entire study area from east to west and also a loop uh, trail on the west portion. Uh, in terms of habitat, this alternative uh, impacts less shallow water habitat than concept B, uh, and it impacts more of the cottonwood ash forest in the interior of the island. Uh, and it, it allows for a net increase in shallow water habitat, uh, but somewhat less wetland and forest <clears throat> uh, preserved or enhanced uh, than an alternative B. Uh, it also shows uh, retaining the Port of Portland's wetland mitigation site within the marine terminal uh, and maintaining the 100-foot buffer around it. Um, so this is what this alternative looks like. Uh, again, the area, you know, the access um, from the bridge, uh, here is the bridge location. Uh, the area of more intensive development is located here, uh, an access to Oregon Slough here. Uh, and then a series of uh, more developed trails uh, accessing uh, the Columbia River and then several um, viewpoints and um, fishing accesses along those ridges of uh, dredge material placement. Uh, and then a, the loop trail at this end of the island uh, with several accesses to this existing large beach at the northwest portion of the site and to the um, tip of the island. So could you just talk a little bit about the bridge that it says Marine Terminal and Recreation Access Bridge? Is that a, a auto traffic bridge? This is a new bridge for auto traffic, and it would be both uh, traffic to the Marine Terminal and, um, and for the recreational access. Commercial and residential. Traffic. So what commercial purposes are actually served by the bridge? Given the the scheme and the layouts and the types of cargo that have been imagined here? Given this terminal configuration it would be mostly primarily autos. Vehicular traffic related to taking employees. Autos. Employees besides employees. Auto term the auto terminal, the actual cars. There may be trucks taking those autos off site. That would be the commercial component of it. This, uh, this bridge then on A would not affect the, uh, the property residents as much as the other bridge. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. We're also showing uh, areas of uh, enhanced wetlands, um, particularly on the Oregon Slough side in these um, several areas where there are existing wetlands and shallow water habitat. We're showing the, the wetland habitat can be expanded and around uh, Benson Pond, showing the opportunity for some uh, expanded uh, wetlands and shallow water habitat. 
in addition on the um, – actually, I'm going to go back one. Um, we are showing uh, on both alternatives but in different configurations a um, buffer uh, cons- consisting of um, – a 10-foot high uh, berm created out of out of soil and then uh, planted with native vegetation um, on the south and and west sides of the marine terminal and there's a cross section of it here uh, that I'll, I'll that's shown in this figure um, and this is intended to be a buffer um, for noise and light both for uh, recreational visitors and for wildlife. Um, one of the things that we're taking into consideration is that, you know, vegetation is effective at, at screening light and providing uh, habitat, but it isn't going to be very effective at limiting noise. And so the intent is to, you know, to try to provide more separation from the marine terminal and the open space uh, using this berm. So um, concept Peter, B, yes. Uh, you mentioned residential access from the bridge as well? Yeah, Matt mentioned that. So yes. what does that mean? There's, you could, there's actually a through fare from the marine, from the bridge that goes over the Oregon Slough to East Hayden Island. We could go back to that same, slide if you want to. And it's the same access road for the terminal? Yeah, we'll go back to you want me to go back that further. One's, that, that one's fine. I can probably. What we have is, is we have the. Lost my mouse. May I okay. not? Yeah, go ahead. Second. Uh, just on the bridge issue, um, that is one of the studies that will be done as part of the concept plan work refinement to determine the viability or the necessity of a bridge to serve the facility. So um, this is more for illustration purposes okay. than actual um, certainty. Yeah, I guess I, I would never been. I had never been aware that there was a residential connector part of that as well. Yeah, through conversations with the advisory committee, there was a potential to have the access to East Hayden Island mm-hmm. as a through fare from Marine Drive. Okay, so you don't have to go back and show me. It, but. So moving on to concept B. Um, so what this is showing? Yes, I just want to, if I could, follow up on Commissioner Salzman's point. So this is. This is uh, residential access for recreation, the assumption being, it, when you say, I just want to make sure we're not assuming any residential Mm-mm. use <laughs> on the island. It's the it, it would non-port be res- function. <laughs> it would be residential access to East Hayden Island, Hayden Island. Yeah. F- through this bridge as a through route. Right. So yeah. it's citizens, yeah. uh, the public. public. Right. Yeah, but people who live on East Hayden Island. It's an alternative access for residents right. of East Hayden Island. And then it would connect, <coughs> and again, just conceptually speaking, where would it connect back to East? It wouldn't connect to East Hayden Island, or it would? I'm not reading yeah. the map. Where is the map? So, you might have to show them on that. We have to, you wanna, we have to go back all the way. So I got it. Tell me when to stop. One more. Yeah, it would. What you have here is the bridge that comes over the Oregon Slough, right? And then there will be a 90-degree turn to the east, and the access would be. Oh, I see. Up through right there. there. Okay. Thank you. It serves three purposes: recreation for anyone potentially, and then access, alternative access for island residents, and potentially then a commercial case. Although I'd have to say that's going to be a, quite a stretch to imagine that there's a commercial justification for the bridge. Thanks for the clarification. The, the primary reason for studying the bridge is, I think you're correct, that it, it's not about the traffic counts. It's more about whether we want to send trucks through East Hayden Island. And, and right now, Marine Drive is a truck route, and East Hayden Island does not have a truck route. So it's it's about managing truck traffic and, and commercial traffic res, relative to residential areas. This isn't advancing. Okay, so concept B for the um, management zones, um, what this is showing is uh, in response to having a terminal footprint that is 
uh, pushed further east. Uh, it's showing uh, actually the more intensive recreation use east of the railroad bridge on what is you know currently private land uh, that would require acquisition, but keeping all of the parking, picnicking, um, uh, any kind of uh, boat launching uh, access uh, on the on the east side of the railroad bridge and uh, off of uh, the West Hayden Island study site. Uh, it's then showing the area of more um, kind of uh, mixed um, uh, trail use on the north side of the marine terminal with a access to the Oregon Slough on one location following the power line corridor, and that's just a visual access. Uh, and then uh, most of the, all of really all of the western end of West Hayden Island uh, has no access by land. Uh, we're just showing a seasonal high water access uh, water trail uh, that would be coupled with uh, wetland and shallow water habitat enhancement. So, so for canoes and kayaks during high water periods. Um, so. Going on to the next slide. So this is assuming that the access uh, to the site for recreation is um, via East Hayden Island, so no bridge um, under this scenario, uh, showing intensive recreation, uh, what we're calling that again, which is things like picnicking, restrooms, uh, boat launch. Um, we're considering in this alternative that you could have a nature center um, on that area east of the railroad tracks. Uh, and then in terms of trails, uh, only showing the ADA accessible trails, um, but a more um, limited um, area that is um, on the north side of the marine terminal along the beach. Uh, and then um, we're including a, uh, the idea of maybe a viewing tower, uh, could be a viewing tower for uh, the terminal operations as long as that isn't a security concern for the port or there could be a viewing tower for more nature viewing. Uh, and then this seasonal um, water trail, as I mentioned. In terms of the habitat overall, um, this alternative impacts more shallow water habitat on the Oregon Slough side, on the south side uh, of the study area, and uh, has less impact on this mature cottonwood ash forest in the interior of the island. Uh, and it has a greater potential increase in wetland and forest habitat compared to alternative A. Um, it also has, in both alternatives, have a net reduction in grassland habitat, which is one of the more disturbed habitat types. Uh, this alternative has a, a slightly larger reduction in that habitat type. And the Port of Portland's wetland mitigation site uh, is, uh, would need to be relocated under this scenario, so we're not trying to preserve that within the marine terminal. Could you explain a little more about why there's less shallow water habitat on the Oregon Slough side? Yes. Um, the reason is because the, the footprint of the marine terminal extends further south. It extends south of the east-west power line corridor in this alternative, and in this area there is existing shallow water habitat that would be impacted by the presence of the marine terminal there. Where would the uh, commercial traffic come in on this on B? So it would come in, well, it would pretty much be all the commercial vehicle traffic would come in from the east under the railroad bridge in this, in this location. Through East Hayden Island. Through East Hayden Island? Be through East Hayden Island. And, so, and does your study assume that the Columbia River Crossing Bridge is going to get done in a certain time frame? <laughs> yes, the baseline for the transportation work for this whole project is, starts with a Columbia River crossing assumption, and obviously that's something we would have to revisit if, if that wouldn't, wasn't going to happen. And, and tell me a little bit more about this parking access road and, and the active Okay, recreation. so what this is showing is a, uh, a road extending 
um, south from the access, so extending to this location along Oregon Slough, where you would have a parking and picnic area, potentially a nature center and restrooms, and a boat launch uh, to access uh, Oregon Slough. And then at the north end of that intersection, you'd have a small parking area uh, to access this trail that runs under the railroad tracks and along the uh, northern portion of the marine terminal and provides access to the beach there, which is currently um, you know, popular for people walking. Uh, and then uh, it's showing the trail continuing uh, to the north-south power line corridors and following, uh, having a viewpoint to Benson Pond and then a couple more viewpoints, one on a wetland and one on Oregon Slough. So that's the extent of trail access. And is there currently a manufactured home community there, or what, what is the existing use on that uh, side of the bridge? That's an existing um, industrial use. It's an auto auction site currently. It's owned industrial. Um, the the northern portion, I believe, is actually vacant uh, right now. Um, yeah, the portion right along the river is is uh, undeveloped. And is it privately owned, that property? Yes. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is this um, opportunity that we're showing to connect uh, the Columbia River and the Benson Pond area where <coughs> the shallow water and wetland habitat is uh, enhanced and expanded um, across to uh, Oregon Slough with a shallow water and wetland habitat and seasonal canoe trail, canoe kayak trail connecting to existing wetlands uh, on Oregon Slough. Um, so this is showing a um, sound and, um, and light buffer on the north and west sides of the, of the marine terminal, and that's shown in this cross-section. So similar concept to what we were showing on concept A. It's just in this case it's closer to the shoreline of the Columbia River. I had another question. So in concept A, it looks like it would not be that any impact traffic-wise to the residents, where B looks like it would be a lot of, uh, of – is Mike correct on that by looking at this? Wouldn't they have to come from I-5 on down through the residents? Eric, do you want to – the transportation study hasn't been completed, but – Okay, I'm just yeah, curious. I mean, that's the, the assumption is that there's a greater impact to East Hayden Island residents from potential commercial traffic with that option A or with option B because there wouldn't be a separate bridge um, – it, it a little bit depends on what actual facilities you have if, ha, have out there. If they're primarily rail-oriented freight, it, it's less. If you have, uh, as Matt indicated, if you had um, local car shipping coming off in trucks, that's a different story. And so it, it's a little bit hard to tell at the stage the volume of that. If but, I if I could, I think the to maybe also move us to the mix and match nature. It there is mix and match. So the question of separate access bridge or access from East Hayden Island, it might be useful moving forward to sort of break it out as opposed to alternative A and B, although we, that helps us refer to, the, oh, thank to you. the maps. Thank you. Yeah, you'd, absolutely you can take the bridge and put them on either of these options. We, okay. we chose to not show it on one for the sake of conversation. Okay, thank you. I just want to make an observation. Uh, I don't have a question, but from what I understand on alternative B, the um, south end of the <coughs> intensive recre recreational use is in a no-wake zone. And if you have intensive recreational use in a no-wake zone, you're going to have a kind of a difficult time with an awful lot of people as opposed to alternative A. You're not in a no-wake zone and you have a smaller recreational use. But... It's just an observation of something that probably is going to have to be taken into consideration somewhere along the line because you're going to run into a lot of problems on that. No, absolutely, and, and, and it's not what we have assumed is it's a non-motorized recreational use. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the boat launching could be uh, – we, we haven't really defined it as motorized or non-motorized. I would say at this point we're leaving that open, um, and, and so if it's non-motorized, then – you know, would be consistent with that that no wake zone. Commissioner Chamberlain, uh, I take it we're taking we're taking questions now. <laughs> no. 
But no. go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not supposed to. Go just, ahead. Just yes. a <laughs> flurry of questions, and I, I have one or two. Um, I heard earlier that B is not consistent with the resolution passed at the city, which I think from the port standpoint may be pl- problematic. Uh, all of our planning has been based upon the resolution. Uh, so I, I'm just curious why option B, why the deviation from the original resolution? Yeah, I, I can answer that. Why, why and where are the deviations? That would right. be helpful. The, to be yeah. specific on the drawing that's up on the screen, you can see the east-west power line corridor kind of cutting across the the middle there, and that was in the council resolution the presumed southern boundary of the footprint. Um, as Matt said, the both still are 300 acres, but we did uh, deviate from the council resolution with this option or with that footprint uh, in this option. The rationale for that was um, there are really probably two big. There's a lot of different environmental issues, but there are two big issues from an ecological environmental perspective that have been are driving a lot of the site design discussions on that end and one is the shallow water habitat and the concern for salmon impacts because the threatened and endangered salmon that's critical habitat for them so that option a responds to that element of the environmental concern a, a second environmental concern is the uh, size and significance of the interior forest habitat on the site And um, the option A takes a pretty big um, bite out of that habitat type. And from an environmental perspective, one of the the ecological concepts or principles that we try and deal with is um, maintaining contiguous pieces of habitat rather than having long, skinny strings of habitat. And so, you know, in an ideal sense, you want a round, contiguous piece of forest because it has more undisturbed interior relative to its semi-disturbed edge condition. And so option B was an attempt to ask Worley Parsons to say, what would it take to address that environmental concern? And and obviously there's some trade-off there in terms of um, impact to shallow water. And that was that exercise was useful in helping us understand that potential trade-off. And so we thought it was worth asking them to pursue that for the sake of that element because we know that um, the interior forest habitat is one of the big environmental concerns out there. So, Eric, just to follow on on that, if I could, um, the prioritization, I mean, at some point we have to make trade-offs. So you have listed species in the shallow water habitat and a fairly um, heavy federal mandate associated with that. And then you have the desire to maintain this forest habitat that you just described. Um, so what will be the city's priority in that case? Because uh, you can't have it all, I guess. Yeah, we don't know at this point. I mean, that's why we developed this, so that we could look at what that trade-off might look like. And um, as, as you've suggested, there are some issues um, with permitting in shallow water, and that's that's something we're going to be looking at over the next few months as to what the differences are there. The whole site is in the floodplain, or a lot of it is in the floodplain, so even that interior forest is important to the, to the federal permitting authorities, too. They're going to be looking at the whole impact to the site, um, but obviously a lot of environmental rules are specific to wetlands and, and below ordinary high, so... Uh, I think it's something we want to look at and and try and understand better. Um, The fill cost may be different in the two alternatives as well, and we also are aware that the the impact to the power line is not inconsequential. There's a cost to to dealing with that. So um, we're by no means endorsing option B. It's it's, it's, uh, an idea was to look at what are those those alternatives, and, and that would be informing whatever hybrid proposal we come up with or whatever uh, final concept C, if you will. Uh, have you coordinated uh, option B with the port to understand what the ramifications might be on the port facility and on cost? Uh, We're working on that now. and, and But um, you're going to roll this out to the citizens very soon, right? They're going to be looking at option B and putting input into it. And yes. do we really know if that's really a viable option? We think it's worth looking at, um, but again, it's too early to say what, what if it's if it's got a fatal flaw. And I know that the port has uh, spent a lot of time in developing plans for the option A footprint. How is that going to be incorporated into what you're doing with the citizens' output? 
We've uh, invited input. the port to participate in the open houses, and, and they're going to have uh, their concepts uh, or other versions of what might fit in, con- in the footprint A on the table there, and we're going to be specifically asking the folks who show up to also comment on what aspects of the port's drawings the city and the advisory committee ought to sort of pick up on and incorporate if there are good ideas there that, that we should be looking at. I guess one of my biggest concerns here is cost. I mean, how we survive as a port is being competitive globally. And um, how have you addressed costs uh, for the development of the facility in your concepts? That That's sort of the next step in this analysis is to be moving into the um, – specific uh, infrastructure needs of the different options and to cost get some preliminary costs, for example, on the bridge and some of the fill parameters and what those differences might look like. Um, we're not to that step yet, but that's, that's where we're going next. But you're bringing this out to the citizens, and we're bringing out a plan where we haven't really evaluated costs. It seems like you're getting the cart before the horse. It seems like we should look at the plans – what can be developed, you know, what legally can we develop, what meets the footprint, and what is the lowest cost of development so we can build a port facility rather than rushing something out to the citizens and getting their input on something that may not even be realistic, may not even happen. Um, One of the things that's – Susan Anderson, the director of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, uh, one of the things that's important in this is to get the best ideas out there. And if we limit ourselves and do the – Um, all the work that you'd have to do on a cost-benefit analysis without even knowing what the parameters are, that study would, you know, would be a million dollars. So you need to go out first and come up with um, what the parameters are in terms of what the options are that meet the needs that we're trying to go for, the goals that we're trying to go for. If we just went to the cost first, we'd probably eliminate all sorts of good options. I mean, I think the other piece there is that um, we're trying to be transparent with this process. That's been one of the the ongoing issues um, in terms of input we get as a bureau on this project is is are we doing this in a transparent way that's putting all the cards on the table? And and so that was our perspective in putting out the options before the cost analysis. So if I could, oh, you aren't done. Are you done? No. Uh, oh, no. One more. Not, uh, <laughs> no, I've, got, I've got two more there questions. We go. Okay, two more questions, and then Mayor and uh, Commissioner Fritz um, jump in. A statement and two more questions. It seems to me that I understand where you're coming from, and I appreciate the City Council uh, putting this process together, uh, putting structure to it, transparency, and uh, a very diverse group of folks looking at this. But it seems to me that rolling something out to citizens uh, to get their input without um, the port's input on what works and what doesn't work doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, uh, my last two questions is, um, will the port be able to use the entire 300 acres? The the intent is to of this project is to establish what the zoning boundaries and, and annexation agreement is. So the the presumption is if the city council votes to annex that there would be industrial, marine industrial uses allowed on the 300 acres. Um, the exact parameters of what's allowed and what isn't and what, what is allowed by right and what would require any kind of future review, that is the, the negotiation of the plan district language itself. And so it's too early to say specifically what those you know, parameters would be. But I think in general, yes, that's the intent, is that that we wouldn't be going through this if we didn't um, – if we decide to annex for the purpose of marine terminals, we've got to allow that use and not um, and be clear about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Marianne. Uh, my, um, having been through a couple of decades of planning processes, it um, in in an issue as complex as this, it we're in the we're in the midst of an iterative process. You and the reason that. Um, We hired uh, the experts that we did is to find out if there was within a 300-foot footprint based on what we know. So this is still low confidence if there was technically – if it was technically possible to put together a uh, marine terminal, marine-related terminal that could basically work. 
could work. And that's my understanding of what is included thus far. To answer your question, this is, does it work? So we hired experts because we don't have expertise on our team to see if it works. And, and the result so far has given us two footprints for, as I understand it, and I'm asking this as a question, that based on what we know, again, it's early, so low confidence in terms of uh, being able to answer definitively, but thus far you have found a two 300-acre footprints that would work for this type of marine terminal? That's correct. Okay. And we have begun to look at the environmental impacts of two different types of footprints, having sort of just this first step of basic workability for both the environmental and for both the uh, economic side, um, you'd provide us with a sort of mix and match options. Um, the next step in the iteration is more about, okay, we figured out a way to do this in sort of the real world of some of these constraints and opportunities. The next iteration then starts getting into costs. And then we're able to do the back, and then you go back and forth again a couple times to sort of get costs and benefits. I have found it useful along the way to get public input on each one of those costs and benefits sort of iterations back and forth. Um, and so it will be absolutely key to me as well uh, to get to a rough level of cost and benefit. It's, um, and, and it, uh, I've, although it tries my patience, um, this kind of an effort, I do find that the end result is a higher degree of confidence than other cities get to experience after similar kinds of very complex efforts. But we're nowhere, we're not near the place yet of saying the cost benefit here means we go forward. But we need to cover that ground before we're done. Thank you, Mayor. One um, other comment maybe on this footprint issue is that Stepping back, the purpose of this exercise is not to design the specifics of the rail loop for the port. It's really to figure out what potential zoning footprints we ought to consider on the site in the future. And so, Well, just to um, be clear, it's, it also we were very clear in our direction and we're working with everybody is it, we, wanted, we were unsure if a 300-acre footprint would work at all for anything of much value for a deep water marine port. And we're also interested to know is – in, in looking at this sort of mixed use, is there any real value to uh, our environmental aspirations that could happen on, a, on the remaining footprint? So the workability issue is a really big question. There are some folks that doubted, and I just didn't know, whether you could do anything on 300-foot footprint. But we know that uh, from the port's work, we know that the 300-acre footprint works on al alternative A. We don't know if the 300-acre footprint works on our alternative B. We don't know that. I think that yet yeah, it's the definition of work. If it we've Well the port hasn't weighed in and said B will work. Exactly. And and that's really important to put that out there on the table from a does it work in the real world as opposed to is it a is it worth it? Is the value proposition worth it? That is a important and additional question we need to answer. Your point that on there's been more previous work on the viability, the economic viability of A is true. And lack of sort of that kind of work on B has not been done. So it needs to be done. But it was also important for all of us to make an informed decision by, well, it was important to staff that they sort of lay out the options and the impacts uh, to the environment as well. I mean, that is part of what the, the charge that we gave them. I do have, though, a, a, in a similar vein as Commissioner Chamberlain, is uh, why, oh, why would you put a non-bridge access to West Hayden Island with the prospect of it trucks driving through the neighborhood? What caused you to want to venture into that kind of uh, planning alternative making? Uh, well, it's, it's to recognize that, as, as some of the questions were hinting, that the driver of that bridge may not be, in fact, the commercial traffic. And, and, and it's a very – obviously, a bridge is an expensive prospect. So in order to be confident that we want and need a bridge, we need to see what would happen without one. Commissioner Fritz. Um, 
Commissioner Chamberlain, I had similar concerns as to why are we doing this today and what, why are these concepts on the table before we have the cost-benefit analysis. This has been very helpful in um, outlining to me that these are concepts and, that, and more than that, that they're pieces they're mix and match, as the mayor earlier said. So I hope when citizens are commenting at the open houses and sending in emails that it's neither I like A or I like B, I want to know what pieces of A are important and what pieces of B so that we can put that forward into the cost-benefits analysis. Uh, similarly, that the port hasn't weighed in on concept B, city council hasn't yet weighed in on whether we're um, interested in examining whether to go beyond the utility lines. I worked with uh, Mayor Adams to craft that resolution. And so I am really interested in looking at, now that the work has progressed in a very transparent manner, and thank you very much to all the citizens and other and staff who have been working on the advisory committee and on the consultants, we're developing in a very open and transparent manner some more concepts as to what might work and what might work for both the environment and for industrial jobs. So I think that's really important that we are doing this step, kind of sausage making in public, knowing that the real decisions are going to be made next year when we've had a lot more time for both the port and the council to hear from citizens on the pieces that they appreciate on both parts and the concerns they have on both parts, because I want to know both parts. Um, Bill, then Ken, then Peter. Oh, uh, Paul, no. Bill, Paul, Ken, Peter, Dan. Right this <laughs> uh, You know, just because I know there will be a lot of attention focused on the bridge issue, I, I want to make this point, and it's the same point I made to the council, I think, when the resolution was adopted. Um, by creating essentially a 300-foot um, footprint and with the nature of the in-water um, dock facilities that are associated with this, <clears throat> you're really uh, – defining the types of cargo that are going to be handled here. So, for example, it won't be a container terminal, and a container terminal would involve um, a lot of uh, truck traffic. In Portland, all of our container activity is local. So it arrives um, at the terminal by truck, and it departs by truck. Uh, we get virtually no grain um, in Portland that arrives by truck. We get no soda ash, pot ash, any of the other bulk cargoes. They don't arrive by truck. They all arrive by um, either barge, in the case of uh, many of the grains, particularly those that um, emanate from the, the Columbia River Basin, um, or by rail, which is why the rail configuration is so important. On the auto side, <clears throat> um, if, um, if the... Um, Terminal operators, the auto terminal operators here were depending on the local market in order to draw um, auto traffic to Portland, these, you know, Honda, Toyota, uh, Hyundai, et cetera, they wouldn't be here. Um, <clears throat> almost 90 percent of those vehicles get on rail, um, and they're going back to Chicago or to other locations. It's good business while it's here, but <clears throat> the the truck volume is incredibly limited. So, um I can say with great confidence that there will be no commercial case for a um, for a bridge. There may be another case. Um, I think that the access for the residents of uh, East um, Hayden Island is is certainly one to be discussed, particularly within the context of whatever may happen with the uh, crossing. Um, and I know that's been a point of uh, of some concern. But as a commercial um, tenant or as a, a commercial appendage to the type of terminal that you described in the resolution that was adopted by the council a year ago or whenever it was, um, it really is not going to be – I can just predict with, with confidence that it isn't going to be a very strong business case. Yeah, thank you. Bill. Uh, Commissioner Rosenbaum. Yeah, I uh – What's technically possible is vastly different than what's legally possible. And um, for anybody working on this project or involved in it at all, they have to be totally cognizant of the past federal court decisions based on environmental issues. I mean, those are things that are just sticking in front of all of us, and uh, you have to understand that and understand the environmental impact involved in it. So my question to you is very simple. I, from what I understand, uh, alternative A has at least been vetted in terms of what the legal issues will be in the future, and alternative B hasn't been at this point. And if if you're looking at an alternative 
and you understand what the consequences are going to be down the road in the future, why bring it to us at this time until you can tell us without a doubt, nobody can do that, but you can at least be uh, fairly uh, confident that alternative B is a viable proposal. And what's bothering me right now is that I don't think you can tell us that at this point. Now, I may be wrong, but from a legal point of view, I don't think you're at that point. And if you're not at that point, why are we looking at it? I think option A is also I mean, any permitting of a facility out in West Head now is going to be very challenging from all aspects, whether there's a bridge or a dock in the Columbia River. Um, so I think it's also – it may be – we believe option A, we have a little more understanding of option A, but I would not say that we are confident that option A is permittable either. I think that both would have potential challenges from different perspectives, um, and the next step is to think through those different those different challenges. Yeah, just if, if I could, because I don't know the tradition of the Port Commission, and maybe we're having sort of a, a, a little bit of a mixing of cultures, um, <laughs> we, this is the can-do uh, culture here. It used to be all yours, you know. I know. I was, <laughs> the, today, in our sort of tradition, uh, today is a work session. Today is not about decision-making. Today is about asking tough questions of staff and challenging all assumptions uh, as you are doing. And from that, it allows staff to, before they go out to the public, to make sure that at least along the way there's a marker where they sat with us and, oh, we didn't necessarily think of it that way kind of thing. So today is really low – I mean, in our – the way we do this today would be low pressure, high dialogue, and uh, and it's not why – so in other words, it's – we would answer it's here today to make – it's just a check-in to make sure – that they have really thought through it from all different angles, and there's going to be expertise around this table that staff doesn't have before they go out to the public. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Commissioner Allen. Mayor, we're used to having low-pressure, high-dialogue high discussions. <laughs> <laughs> I want to weigh in on the recreational um, aspects because when I first looked at the this project, I thought there was a lot of benefit to the citizens of Portland seeing the port and the city have a unique project that's going to open up recreational opportunities for average folks here in the city to be able to go a short distance. And uh, I see option A is much better for recreation opportunities, hiking, running, biking, fishing, a beach. And I uh, would ask folks to take a look at Mental Brown Island Park south of Salem. It's a... It's it, to me, it reminds me of what the west part of this island could be for recreation opportunities. Uh, the bird habitat is very good. There's wildlife, wildlife habitat there. Um, and there's only a couple small parking lots. It doesn't have high use, but it's got regular use. Uh, uh, people that really love that island for uh, family recreation opportunities. And I see that as a really unique opportunity here for us to create something for Portland citizens, a place that they can go to and they can say the Port of Portland and the city created this for us and our families. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Bragdon. It's me now. Yeah. So I'll start with our culture of thanking you for all the hard Work that you've done, and appreciate your being here and taking the, <laughs> taking these, and for all of you being here. That's right. Um, that said, I do want to just to be on the record, echoing what other port commissioners have said. And it's not to me; it's not just about the cost. But I thought you did a really nice job of laying out some of the gives and takes on the environmental issues. And to me, on having more clarity around the gives and takes and trade-offs on flexibility for that side, whether it's rail speeds and things like that, because to lay them all out for one type of thing, even if we, they're not known, even knowing that they're not known would be a useful thing. So we just want the public to understand that there are a number of those trade-offs that may affect the flexibility and financial viability of this, uh, which it has to have. It's not just environmental. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Salzman. So I guess um, given what uh, Executive Director Wyatt was saying about the bridge and the 300-acre configuration that there's really no need, if I'm reading this correctly, from the port's perspective for a bridge. No commercial need. No commercial, no commercial need. need. Right. Meaning the port doesn't? Need a bridge. Okay. 
for Career 42. So what, I, no, I guess on a cost benefit. Based on, any on kind what of a, they know thus far. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're still on the Because yes. the, the Early 300 on, we don't think we need a bridge. Yeah. You were saying would eliminate containers. Well, it's not just the 300. <clears throat> Uh, 300 acres, excuse me. It's not just the 300 acres. I think if you look at either of the alternatives in the dock configurations, <clears throat> the types of docks that are essentially built away from the shoreline mm -hmm. um, really aren't going to support <clears throat> container-related uh, activity here. And um, <clears throat> it is a bigger subject. So I guess, than yeah, okay, I, yeah. I, I get it. But I guess my, my question is on, on what kind of a scenario, I mean, would a cost-benefit analysis justify a bridge given – what we've just heard. I mean, would residential access alone justify the cost? I, mean, I don't know the cost of a bridge, but they're pretty expensive. One, yeah. one perspective from a planning viewpoint is, um, you know, we just finished up the East Hayden Island neighborhood planning process, and and um, and if the Columbia Crossing would go forward and there were, were a light rail station there, the plans for East Hayden Island envision a light rail-oriented station type of community in that area, which um, is not uh, generally the kind of thing where you would want to have too much truck access. And we realize that from Bill's uh, point that there may not be very much, but uh, from a land use perspective, there may be a rationale for um, making sure that the, even the limited truck traffic were to not have the option of going to East Hayden Island. Um, or, and as you said, there may be other reasons why a secondary access to the island would be beneficial in either case. Um, mar essentially, Marine Drive is a truck route and East Hayden Island Drive is not. And so, okay. uh, Anyway, it just, it just seems like it would be a tough case on a cost-benefit analysis, but I won't prejudge that. So I, I just wanted to ask the other question, is the is it permittable to develop underneath utility corridors? Under the what? Utility, utility corridors? You need to move. Underneath like option it. B shows? Mm -hmm. uh, they would need to be moved. Moved, yeah. Oh, they'd be moved. Right. Oh, okay. So. Commissioner Holty is next, and what I would recommend, um, Peter, are you you're not done with your presentation? I am you? done. Oh, yes. you are done. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell. Uh, no. All right. So, okay, then we're. Is there more presentation to be made? So we are. Okay. Have at Have it. Have at it. Okay. I was on the West Hayden Island Working Group for a long time, and the feedback I received was the neighborhood wanted that bridge access because they did not want truck traffic coming through where they live, okay? So in my mind, my mind, that bridge has to be built for the simple reason is this should not impact the residents. This, if the bridge was built, they would not have any impact whatsoever. And now they got a second way in and out of their, their uh, residential area. So I am maybe different than others, but I think that bridge needs to be built for the simple reason is not impact the people that live on that island. That's my point. If, if, if I could, though, another, and I have, uh, just to get capture the questions on the table, in other land use decisions, we have been able to put limits on truck traffic. Mm -hmm. So you kind of call the question. I just Again, I have concerns about truck traffic through West Hayden Island. We just did a, a land use decision in East Portland that limits the number of trucks and there's enforcement and all kinds of things. Right. So. And we're, we're very, you know, we're very accustomed to the impact of trucks on the residential neighborhoods because we deal with them in St. John's. Um, I'm not proposing that just – All the yeah, time. No, yeah, I think right. that's – it's so an it's important subject. So it's not a subject. bridge, no bridge. And I, I think that binary. the <clears> – <throat> one right. thing to keep in mind, all this – discussion began before it was entirely clear how the CRC was going to play out, not that it's entirely clear now, but um, the particularly the impact on uh, West Hayden Island, there was a point, I think, at which um, the idea of an arterial bridge um, or an additional bridge might have been part of the CRC, and it may be too late uh, for that, or that may be a subject that gets revisited. So. Um, Okay, so that, you know, you have to think about it in that context as well. I just wanted uh, not to have people wander out of here thinking that um, the port was going to find a commercial value in the bridge because I'm not sure that's going to be the case. And I think that's fair, but just to avoid confusion and a deluge of emails, part of the agreement we have on the CRC is an arterial bridge on the east side. Okay. And, uh, Commissioner Chamberlain, Commissioner Daggett. 
Commissioner Johansson. <laughs> the port's owned this land for a long time, and when it bought it, the assumption was that they had they would develop the full 800 acres. And under any scenario, 500 acres of our land will be in natural areas and whatever. Uh, what kind of credit are you going to give the port for basically giving up $100 million um, for natural areas? It's probably too early to directly answer that question, but obviously the the – when we're considering mitigation for the impacts of the project, there will be specific impacts to specific kinds of habitat, and there will be traffic impacts, and there will be some impact to residents. And there's the the way we envision it is the annexation agreement would have spell out some parameters for what those how we're addressing those things, and certainly the the how we manage the 500 acres in the future and what the terms of that are will be part of that package. Uh, I don't know what the specifics are, but I think that is part of the discussion. So there, there is some thought about giving us credit for that $100 million. Again, I don't know if I could answer it, but I, I'm sure that that will be part of the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> what, what form of credit are you looking for? Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> Daggett. Um, so obviously we've seen a preview of the complexity of, of uh, these concepts. Um, and uh, and it's not clear to me that the mix and match opportunities between A and B are as obvious, uh, with the exception of the bridge, as uh, I, I don't necessarily see how you preserve 300 acres between A and B uh, in a mix and match scenario. So with the looming possibility of an alternative C, and the lingering questions about the regulatory and legal implications of these options, I just want to make sure that the time frame that we're looking at is realistic uh, with a completion date of July. That's of some concern as well. To, Eric, can you speak to that? It's uh, a point of anxiety uh, for us, of course. Yeah. Um, again, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good at this stage because we've come quite a bit of distance since um, – the late spring this year, and um, Matt After is... After today? Yes. Okay. Uh, it, this was very useful because we certainly learned a lot about what your perspectives are from these different components of the of the two options, and that's, that's very helpful. Um, Matt will be working on uh, moving forward with development of, of what are the preferred elements of these. Um, things like the bridge, you, you know, that's probably... It isn't a binary thing like like you were saying. It could be part of the terms where there's a trigger or a threshold, and that may be true with a number of these elements. So um, we don't have to necessarily definitively answer every one of these choices in this concept plan. Um, there's going to be some – all we're trying to do is establish some boundaries for to start planning. So we can kind of cut off that conversation at a fairly clear date. Um, in the next couple of months and move into that more of the development of those terms and that and that annexation and zoning um, we don 't have to go to the to the nth degree in terms of figuring out all the curves in the rail and where the road exactly is going to be and so I, I feel like we have that ability to stop the conversation and move on to that next step or, uh, Mayor Adams. I do like though the the theme of the questions I think are and concerns are spot on there 's like it 's got to work. I mean, in the practical sense of the word, the turns and in a conceptual basis based on what we know, hired the experts to make sure it works. It's got to be based on our extensive experience, and goodness knows there I see faces out in the crowd, lots of experience, collective knowledge on is it legal, you know, under the variety of laws out there. Do we have a reasonable, uh, a reasonable sense of whether one option or a mix or match is legal or not? And then is it economically viable? And I just want to make sure that one of the options on the table is it economically viable for uh, potentially private, public-private partnerships, which the port has successfully accomplished in the last decade. So there's, you know, is, do inv would investors say either now or in the future as the availability of deep water port development opportunities shrink and shrink and shrink, you got to keep that in mind as well, would it be viable for a future investor? So I think those are all great, and again, it's iterative. Can I um, make a, ask a question and make a point, um, if I might? Uh, I think, Eric, this is probably for you again. Uh, as you know, the 
port has uh, very limited ability to deposit dredge material, and it is West Hayden Island. So with the annexation, um, we have to presume, I would think, that we will be able to continue to dispose of dredge material. It, is that the case? Is that a fair my, assumption? My understanding is that's an existing permitted use on that okay. site. Yeah. So that would be my understanding. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's sort of the port's process to maintain those permits and, and right. deal, deal with that um, separate okay, so from the, the city. Okay, so annexation is benign, so to speak, with respect to that. It's more of a permitting issue. I think that's true, yeah. Okay. Um, we'll, and then we'll, – We'll double check. Okay, you'll double check. Well, yeah. and I that would be very important, yeah. Part of it is also that all things sort of get back on the table. Not that we would change those things, but – when you're looking at all the different options here that are sort of on the back side of this where you're where you can some people can think in pictures and some people can do this alternatives comparison some of these things the more that you can tell us that as the port that you agree on certain things are have to haves versus nice to haves mm -hmm. um, and i think there's not total agreement on council or the port um, on what those things are that helps us when we get to that point um, in terms of the negotiations and in terms of the decision making okay Dredge disposal, have to have. Right. Bridge, don't have to have. <laughs> Would be a start. Anyway, um, my, here's my comment, just in, um, in all seriousness. Uh, this is a great discussion, and I, I think that um, from my perspective and, I, and the Port Commission, I thank you very much for all the hard work that both of our staffs have embarked on, and as well as the uh, work that various commissioners have undertaken with the public to understand these issues. And I I do accept and appreciate that w this is a process and, you know, we have to take appropriate steps first before we can um, come to final conclusion. But I will say the port is um, very uh, um, keen to do whatever we can in an environmentally smart way. And we are – it's part of our culture to be a leader when it comes to blending economic development with environmental protection – and um, the very building that you're in is, you know, a platinum building. And the way that we operate our airports, the way that we operate our marine terminals, um, we are very proud of our environmental ethic. And I say that because I'm very confident that we will find a solution uh, to this that really meets the cultures of all of ours, because I think it's the same culture. I really do. And if you look at the agenda item that's coming up, after this, we've, we're working with the city of Gresham um, for industrial development out there. We've been very successful. Uh, yes, and we're very excited about that. And so I guess what I'm saying is there is a sense of urgency. We have similar values, I think, when it comes to environmental stewardship and creating um, environmental opportunities. But we also have an economy that we want to fire up here and, and get moving. I think we share all that. So that was my well, Low-pressure um, statement. <laughs> <laughs> I did not mean to. Uh, <laughs> I did not mean to imply th that you don't have a uh, not just an ethic, but a series of actions and results about trying to balance the yeah. the economic success and prosperity of our region and state with the uh, environmental success of the region and state. Because you do. I mean, I do have the opportunity to tour ports around the world and. Really is true. It um, is. You really do. Um, no, mine was more around uh, uh, maybe a difference in uh, culture around process. Um, we, as the plan, as the official planning agency for the region, we have to. We do a lot of these kinds of things as a council, and so we just have found it useful instead of the process going all the way to the end, which is also can be done, is to have these kinds of check-ins. So that was the culture that because you're a different, you have a different mission, you have a you're a different. Uh, public uh, agents type of agency that we are not Mayor, that, that was the only difference in culture Mayor, we are very capable of gumming things to death as well so, oh are you yeah. okay all right are there any other um yeah i'd like Mr. to follow Fritz. up um chair excuse me i'd like to follow up chair on your question about dredge materials is the staff and consultants considering where the new dredge site would be since the port facility would be where the current dredge location is Thank you. Yeah, I, I 
the short answer is yes. I think we're assuming that it will be part of uh, the zoned area, that it will continue to function in the zoned area for uh, marine terminal development as, as part of the future of that area. So that'll be something when we come back with the cost-benefit analysis and the refinement that I'm going to be really interested in, because obviously if the port facility is developed, that's going to be there for 100 years or more. I think the assumption is that the forest, that the habitat area is going to be unspoiled for a similar time. So I I want to make sure that that's followed up on. And then I understand that you have done, the port has done a fair amount of analysis on something similar to concept A. Do you know uh, about how many jobs, ongoing jobs, would be created under that? And again, we have not completed the jobs analysis uh, for the smaller footprint, the 300-acre footprint. We did do a jobs analysis for um, the last round, um, and that generated about uh, nearly 5,000 jobs, including direct, indirect, and induced. So, so the, the next, the piece, thank you for that answer, the piece that, again, I'm going to want in, in uh, the middle of next year is about the number of employee trips per day uh, and whether it's 24-7, and because I think that also has a significant impact on bridge or no bridge and transportation patterns within the island. Thank you. Great. Any other uh, questions? From commissioners, mayor, comments. Joe yeah, Hansen, just mm-hmm. really quickly, I think mm-hmm. one of the things that I'm, I'm a bit concerned about is the perception of us not engaging in the port in the development of these concept plans. Worley Parsons and the, and the team has seen all of the port's plans and previous studies built up to this, and we have utilized that information in developing these concept plans. Okay. And for that matter, Alternative B actually provides more acreage on a per acre basis to facilitate operations. So the staff has actually looked at the port, and I don't want that perception to be that we've closed out the port by any stretch of the imagination. We've tried to bring in port and previous studies in the evaluation of our concepts. Well, and, and I think to that end, Matt, I appreciate your comment in that respect. Um, I, my sense is that we're working very well together, right. and I appreciate, um, you know, these are important issues that we need to, um, you know, to put out in a low-key way. And I think that we believe that there's a good working relationship there. Yes, and in closing, I just want to thank uh, um, the mayor of, of uh, Gresham, who just came into the room for – there was unanimous support around the table, uh, Mayor Bemis, for uh, Gresham to pay for half of the project. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, – Peter, Matt, Susie, Eric, Susan, thank you very much. And for everybody who um, came and participated today in, in the whole process, thank you very much for your attention to this important matter. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank, thanks to the port. You yeah. volunteer. You work very hard. Okay. And uh, thanks for your hospitality as well. Yeah. Okay. We're going to take a 10-minute Blackberry break. Usually. <laughs> so 10 minutes. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Thanks for coming out. Yeah. Oh.